Good. So um, we were funded in the second round of SEG's proposals. So we're one of the uh, 14 or 15 lines here that have been funded during this program. That means I've had a chance not only to participate in the program, but to watch the development of lots of other uh, SEG centers uh, over the last 10 years. What I'll try to do is emphasize the science that we've done uh, at the Stanford SEGS as an example of a SEG center and then uh, come to some general issues uh, at the end. So our um, SEGS has been focused on the genetic basis of uh, vertebrate diversity. We all know animals differ in all sorts of interesting ways and uh, we've been trying to tackle really hard uh, old questions about the genetic and the genomic basis of those differences. So uh, we know animals differ. How many genetic changes actually produce those differences? What types of genes underlie the interesting uh, differences you see between naturally occurring species? What types of mutations have occurred? Are there fewer lots of ways of evolving new traits? Now, those are obviously uh, hard, ambitious, uh, old questions. We decided to try to take a genetic and genomic approach to studying them. What we really wanted to do was cross different species with the idea that that would make it possible uh, to map the genetic and the genomic basis of evolutionary change in some well-studied uh, model system. We chose the small fish, uh, the three-spined stickleback, uh, because it's undergone very recent and repeated uh, evolution. The uh, marine fish are like salmon. They live in the ocean, but they migrate into freshwater streams and lakes uh, to breed every spring. That migratory life cycle set off a huge evolutionary radiation at the end of the last ice age when all sorts of new lakes and streams got created, these marine fish migrated in and have since had 10,000 years or 10,000 generations to evolve a whole series of interesting new traits. So uh, that's happened so recently that even though these fish show physical, physiological, and behavioral differences as large as you would see between different genera of animals, it's evolved in the last 10,000 years and you can overcome the reproductive barriers between the different species using artificial fertilization to overcome the largely behavioral and mechanical incompatibilities between the recently evolved forms. That makes it possible to raise fertile F1 hybrids, raise large families, and treat as a genetic mapping problem. How many chromosome regions are there that control the interesting differences? What are the genes and the mutations uh, that, that actually underlie the interesting traits? Now, when we first got interested in the system, uh, Sticklebacks had great biology, thousands of papers and full-length textbooks uh, that had been written about them, but they weren't a traditional model organism. So for example, there were no gen bank entries for three-spined sticklebacks. There were none of the kinds of resources that you take for granted in a model organism. And one of the things that our SEG Center is really focused on is building a complete genetic and genomic toolkit to carry out uh, the genetic analysis of evolutionary change. So to do that has required combining the expertise of lots of different uh, laboratories, including my laboratory that had a background in positional cloning of uh, classical morphological traits in mice. We collaborated with uh, Rick Myers and his group, originally at the Stanford Human Genome Center, with lots of uh, expertise in high-throughput sequencing and genotyping. We also collaborated with Will Talbot, uh, whose background is in zebrafish mapping and mutants and transgenics, and he was key uh, for importing many of the techniques uh, into a, a new fish system. And finally, one of the other uh, co-PIs was uh, Dmitry Petrov, whose background is in population genetics from uh, the biology department uh, at Stanford. We've also had, uh, through SEGS, uh, uh, great collaborations with uh, a variety of other groups, including groups with a lot of expertise in building key genomic resources like back libraries. We nominated uh, three-spine sticklebacks for uh, genome-wide sequencing, and the organism uh, got picked up by the Broad Institute. We've had a very productive collaboration with uh, Shurston Lindblad Tao and her group at Broad, developing both a reference genome and resequencing lots of populations around the world. And then finally, and really importantly, we've also had numerous collaborations with labs whose background is actually in the fish ecological genetics. Uh, they know a lot about the interesting traits that have evolved in particular populations around the world. And many of our genetic crosses got set up uh, by uh, building on fish that had long been studied uh, by uh, Dolph and Mike and Tom and Bjarni. Okay, as a result of all of those groups coming together, today there's a pretty good set of genetic and genomic resources for sticklebacks, including dense genetic and physical maps, genome-wide arrays and genotyping. We've developed transgenic and knockout approaches. There's a high quality reference genome, lots of resequencing, and it has been possible to track multiple evolutionary traits down to particular uh, chromosome regions and genes. 
One other thing I'll point out is that SEGS has a training component, and this was actually a very important part of our uh, center. We set up a summer stickleback molecular genetics lab course modeled after the sort of intense laboratory courses uh, that Cold Spring Harbor used in the founding of the research communities that work on uh, lots of other organisms like phage and yeast. Uh, that course had the structure of bringing in 16 students and a variety of guest faculty every summer and working through the sorts of methods that are being developed by the SEGS, including hands-on microinjection, morpholino, gene expression mapping. We had students start with phenotypes and go all the way through genotyping and uh, QTL mapping of traits during the, during the 10 days of the course. That's been a great way to disseminate the methods being developed uh, by the SEGS and to get a whole cohort of graduate students and postdocs and faculty members uh, incorporating these into their own research or developing stickleback research programs of their own. And since 2003, we've had 200 participants from 15 countries that have, uh, that have come through that course. Okay, so let me give you examples of the kinds of methods uh, that we've been using to study evolutionary differences. Uh, one of the cool things about the fish is a whole range of different traits have evolved in these natural populations, so the very same infrastructure can be used to look at the molecular base of a whole range of uh, interesting characteristics. Give you an example of a skeletal trait. Um, limb changes, of course, have evolved repeatedly in different animals, including one of the most dramatic changes, the complete loss of particular limbs, like the hind limb reduction that has evolved in whales and manatees. That uh, same trait has also evolved in sticklebacks. Uh, this is a marine stickleback, uh, and like most fish and land animals, sticklebacks have two sets of fins, four fins, uh, or arms, and pelvic fins, the equivalent of legs. That's what's uh, shaded here. The hind fin or pelvic apparatus of the stickleback consists of this bony spine that articulates with an underlying pelvic structure. The fish can raise and lower that spine as a defense against softmouth predators, which they do all the time in the ocean. However, many of the marine fish have colonized new freshwater locations where there are no predatory fish. Instead, they're shallow and they're filled with insects. And the way insects prey on sticklebacks is actually to grab onto the pelvic and the dorsal spines. So under a defined set of ecological conditions, it's actually an adaptive trait to lose the pelvic hind fin, and that trait has evolved repeatedly in uh, freshwater populations. So what's the genetic architecture of completely losing a vertebrate limb under a full range of fitness constraints uh, in the wild? Well, you can cross a marine fish with a robust pelvis to a freshwater population that's completely lost the pelvis, raise large families, isolate DNA, type them with a genome-wide set of linkage markers developed uh, by the center. And what we find when we do that is pelvic reduction is not a simple Mendelian trait, but it's a very approachable trait. There's a single chromosome region that controls about two-thirds of the variation in pelvic size in the cross, as well as a series of unlinked modifiers. Different trait, uh, anterior-posterior patterning of armor plates and marine fish, they cover from head to tail. Freshwater fish have evolved uh, uh, greater body flexibility and higher burst swimming speed. They are, typically only have plates here at the anterior end. And if you do exactly the same sort of crossing experiment, marine by fresh, it turns out there's a single chromosome region that controls three quarters of the variation in armor plate number in the cross, as well as a series of unlinked modifier genes. We've also looked at some non-skeletal traits like skin pigmentation, which evolves uh, the fish basically background color match, dark sticklebacks in dark water, light sticklebacks in clear water environments. And if you cross the dark ones and the light ones, there's a single chromosome region that controls about 50% of the variation in the pigment score in particular body regions, as well as uh, unlinked modifiers. So one of the important results from the center, then, is that evolutionary differences that have evolved in natural populations can actually be mapped uh, to major loci. They're not Mendelian traits, but for armor plates and for pelvic loss and for these pigmentation changes, we see major QTLs controlling half or more of the variants, as well as uh, uh, unlinked modifiers. Well, what are those major genes that control a lot of the uh, phenotypes that, that have evolved in these fish? A lot of the work that we've done has been to track those major genes down to uh, particular uh, um, uh, molecules using positional cloning approaches, backwalking, uh, wild type, marine versus freshwater sequencing, and ultimately transgenic rescue. And what we found for all three of these traits is that the major genes that control armor and pelvic loss and pigmentation turn out to be key developmental uh, regulators, either homeodomain transcription factors in the case of pelvic loss or two different signaling molecules in the case of plate patterning and pigmentation. This is the well-known stem cell factor 
uh, that actually controls the formation of lots of different tissues. In fact, that's actually a theme. All three of these major developmental regulators are required for the formation of multiple tissue types. They're well known in the mouse and uh, human disease communities because no mutations in those genes actually cause a whole range of phenotypes because of the key role those genes play in the formation of lots of different tissues. In fact, a mouse that was simultaneously carrying no mutations in those three genes uh, would have short hind limbs and it would be white and it would have dermal bone defects, but it would also be dead about three times over, uh, sterile craniofacial malformations, all sorts of severe anemia and other defects that obviously look like, um, actually what it looks like is the standard objection that many evolutionary biologists had about the participation of major genes in the evolution of uh, phenotypes, and that is these key developmental regulators are so important that if you do something to them, you're going to create deleterious problems and fitness defects. Nonetheless, these are exactly the genes that uh, evolution is using. We have fish swimming around that have uh, genetic variants in all three of those genes. And that raises the issue of the type of mutation that's been selected repeatedly in these natural populations. So if you look at that, so for like the hind limb reduction trait, this PIDX1 homeodomain transcription factor, the sequence of that gene, the coding region of the gene, is identical in the marine fish and the pelvic reduced fish. However, if you look at the expression level, in the marine populations, the gene turns on in the head region in a little spot along the side of the body where the pelvic hind fin would normally develop. In the freshwater population, you still get expression in the head but you completely lose expression in that little spot along the side of the body, which looks like a potential regulatory change that's altered uh, the pattern of expression of the gene. And we think then that what nature has done is to evolve new traits using key developmental regulators, but by making a different kind of mutation than what is typically studied in a mouse knockout lab. The mouse labs knock out the coding region of the gene and get simultaneous defects in all the places where the gene is normally required. In contrast, the sticklebacks have preserved the coding region of the gene. They preserve the information that causes expression in the head and the pituitary. They've simply lost expression at one particular anatomical site in the body. So we think that could be done by a regulatory mutation. And is it actually possible to find that sort of proposed regulatory mutation? Well, we were able to use high-resolution mapping to define a candidate interval upstream of the PIDX1 gene that completely controls the macroscopic presence or absence of a pelvis in wild populations. And to try to identify the postulated regulatory elements, uh, we then used uh, the transgenic approaches that had been developed by the center to fuse sequences from this candidate region uh, with GFP reporter genes, inject those reporters into uh, fertilized stickleback eggs, and of course, what we're looking for is some magic piece of DNA that will drive expression specifically at the site uh, where the fish show changes. And they're there. Um, the key genetic interval for pelvic reduction contains a short sequence that drives expression. I hope you can see this. It's a very specific expression pattern. It turns on specifically at the little site where the pelvis will normally develop along the side of the fish. Well, if that's really the right gene and that's really the right sequence, uh, maybe it would be possible to do an even more ambitious experiment, and that is to try to reverse evolutionary change. So for this experiment, we hooked the marine control information up not to a GFP gene, but to a PIDX1 cDNA, and we injected that into the fertilized eggs from an evolved pelvicless population that would normally never form uh, an external pelvic hind fin. And we were thrilled to see that the introduction of the uh, marine information will actually put the pelvis back on uh, the stickleback. Here's the original evolved population with the vestigial uh, pelvic apparatus. Here's one of these transgenic fish where the introduction of the marine information has stimulated the formation of a robust pelvis and the formation of one of these serrated spines that articulates with the pelvis and the fish can raise and lower it just like a, just like a marine fish. So we really do think this is the right sequence, and then with that in hand, we were able to look at what's happened. One of the nice things about these fish is that the same phenotypes have evolved over and over again. What we found was that different pelvic-reduced populations are using this same mechanism over and over again. Independent pelvic-reduced fish have independent deletions uh, of a few hundred to a few thousand base pairs that completely eliminate this pelvic uh, enhancer region. So this sort of regulatory evolution uh, is playing out over and over again in nature. Okay, so I went through those as examples, and just to come back to the kinds of questions that I mentioned at the beginning, for the uh, genetic mapping of plates and pelvis and pigments and sticklebacks, we find it isn't Mendelian, but nonetheless it's manageable and uh, striking that 
A uh, few regions can have very large effects on uh, these evolutionary phenotypes. The genes that have these large effects turn out to be major developmental regulators that are uh, required for the formation of lots of different tissues. And although those genes are essential for viability, uh, nature has made regulatory mutations in those genes that produce a major alteration at a particular part in the body, but otherwise preserve the function in other places and actually can confer a selective advantage uh, that spreads uh, through populations when the mutations occur. And finally, that mechanism works so well that when the same trait evolves over and over again, exactly the same thing, the same gene, the same regulatory elements are, are, are hit repeatedly. Okay, um, in the early phase of uh, our SEG Center, we focused on uh, these case histories and working out the uh, techniques and technologies to get all the way from a trait down to genes. We've also been very interested in trying uh, to collect enough examples to establish uh, general patterns, and this has been a major theme of uh, the, the recent work at the SEG Center. Here we've been using uh, really the biological trick of the fish. They've evolved the same traits over and over again. We know from the case histories that the same genes tend to be used over and over again. And so we've carried out a genome-wide search for all of the loci in the genome that the fish are using repeatedly, using uh, whole genome sequencing in collaboration uh, with the Broad Institute. So the idea here is establish a reference genome and then do comparative sequencing of multiple examples of marine and freshwater fish that have evolved over and over, uh, window the genome, and look for those places where all of the freshwater fish are consistently different uh, from the marine fish. And if you do that, simply whole genome sequence comparison can actually take you to exactly the same genes that we had found uh, by positional cloning and five years of chromosome walking and transgenic rescue, et cetera. And in addition to the ones we already knew about, it gave us a genome-wide set of regions, a whole set of areas that are being used over and over again in different populations. So the genome-wide analysis, this was published earlier this year, uh, defines 84 different regions because it's coming from a whole bunch of different populations. Each population actually provides informative breakpoints to try to narrow the region. And the size of those intervals defined by the pattern of biological replication is relatively small, about four kilobases. And that's actually really important for us because it then makes it possible to try to address a really old, long-standing and important question, and that's whether adaptive evolution occurs primarily by coding or regulatory changes, not just in the few case histories that you've worked out, but in a genome-wide set of loci. So for those well-defined small regions that have come from the genome-wide comparative sequencing, we can put them into categories. It turns out that 17 percent of the loci show consistent amino acid differences between uh, marine and freshwater fish, but the overwhelming majority of the regions either map entirely to the intergenic areas in between uh, coding exons, or those regions contain both intergenic and coding regions, but the only consistent differences that we see between the marine and the freshwater fish are in the non-coding regions rather than the coding region. So we think the both coding and regulatory contribute to stickleback evolution, but the overwhelming set uh, is regulatory. I think it's interesting to compare those results to recent surveys that have also been identifying loci that have been subject uh, to strong positive selection in the human genome, right? So comparison of a whole series of molecular signatures in uh, different populations around the world has identified a set of loci that also look like they've been subject to positive selection during uh, recent human migrations out of Africa into new environments around the world. Nice paper by Parta Sabeti using the signals from a variety of different tests to narrow uh, set of 178 loci. And I went through her set and just put them in the same categories that I just illustrated for the sticklebacks. And I think it's really striking that in these two genome-wide sets of adaptive loci, the fractions that you see are remarkably similar for uh, the fraction of changes uh, that are coding or regulatory as sticklebacks migrate out of the ocean into fresh water or as humans migrate out of Africa into new environments around the world. And that really suggests that regulatory mutations play a really important role in uh, creating the sort of adaptive changes that underlie the evolution of uh, at least vertebrate species. Okay, so uh, finally, I'll just end with some uh, broader uh, questions and issues uh, about SEGS. This question already got asked, what are the best metrics uh, for success of, of a SEGS? And I think that's a hard question. You can uh, list a whole series of different criteria, including did you did you meet your specific aim? Um, how many papers did you publish? How many citations? Uh, how much is your data being used? 
We've got a stickleback uh, web browser that is now maintained by the SEG Center. It gets about 30,000 hits a year from people that are uh, looking up issues and doing uh, comparative genomics. To what extent has it been possible to use the SEGs to get other grants uh, and awards, patents and technology transfer? And then finally, I mentioned this one earlier, training and education is really one of the mandates of the SEGS program, and you can see the important role that that played uh, in, in our own center. I think the mix of these metrics is going to vary depending on what the project is. I also think probably the most important criteria in the end is whether a center changed uh, what people think and do. And we were pleased in 2005 uh, when the progress on stickleback evolution was cited as part of the scientific breakthrough of the year for evolution in action uh, by Science Magazine. I have to tell you, I was even more pleased when my son came home from his high school biology class and said that they had just spent the day talking about sticklebacks as an example of detailed worked out molecular basis of uh, vertebrate evolution, and this is the kind of thing that is now, uh, that's now in textbooks. And then finally, uh, we've been pleased that I think one of the accomplishments of tackling and trying to build a whole set of genetic and genomic resources for a new organism is that many others have decided that it is possible to try to attack biological questions outside of the standard set of laboratory uh, model organisms. And so there's been a lot of work developing cichlids and guppies and cavefish and killifish and pigeons and paramiscus and other systems, many of whom will directly cite an inspiration coming from watching the progress of, uh, of uh, stickleback research. Just since January, there were two nice papers published uh, in Science and Nature, one on pigeons and the uh, evolution of morphological traits by artificial selection in humans. That uh, paper was done by Mike Shapiro, one of the leads on the PIDX1 work in sticklebacks, who took that approach and then went off and applied it to birds, and Hopi Hoekstra's paper on behavioral evolution in paramiscus, and she also launched uh, the paramiscus system inspired in part by watching the progress of genetic and genomics uh, in stickleback. So um, size and duration of funding, I think one of the key things about the SEG Center is it's targeted at a medium scale, right? Somewhere in between individual R01s and very large uh, sequencing centers. One SEG Center is about the size of six to eight R01s. They have a rigorous review of both the new and the established centers. I think of the first 10 SEG Centers that were funded, only half of them were renewed for the second uh, five years. They all have a finite lifetime. All of the centers end after a, a maximum of, uh, of one renewal. And I think to me the really unique and powerful thing about the SEGS program is, particularly for an institute like NHGRI, this medium scale is very well matched to genome-wide initiatives, right? Genome science is usually bigger than uh, R01 scale science, and I think you can see at least in the story I've told you today that the development of a whole set of genetic and genomic and transgenic resources for a new organism is something we would never would have been able to do uh, as a R01 scale uh, science project. But by bringing together a lot of different people with different expertise in genomics and ecology and population genetics, uh, it has been possible uh, to do that. The other key feature is that the proposals are bottom up rather than top down. Right? NHGRI never issued an RFA for new proposals in stickleback genetics and, uh, and genomics. This is a program that was available at this medium scale but solicited ideas from the community. And I think that this is one of the only places, not only at NHGRI but across uh, the rest of NIH, where investigator-initiated interdisciplinary genome scale research uh, is, is currently funded. And I think that's one of the real achievements of, uh, of the SEGS program. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, Didi is also here to talk about uh, another SEG Center, and Jeffrey can either uh, take questions individually or uh, together at the so end. Particularly if you have questions about the science, why don't we ask those now? And then if there are questions about the program that you specifically want to pose to, the, uh, to, to Didi and David, we can do that together with them up there at the end. Yeah. Are there, any, are there any features in, in and around these uh, regulatory elements that would make a higher chance of recombination occurring and having them deleted? That, that's the first question. And the second question is that if that's the mutational mechanism, then that would mean that the evolution is unidirectional. Once you lose that, I don't see, unless you can pick it up from someplace else, that you wouldn't be able to put that 
put that back in. Yep. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. The first question is something we're quite interested in because that mutation spectrum is unusual. It is deletions over and over again, and they don't actually have the same endpoints. So there are staggered ends in different populations. There's a variety of molecular signatures that suggest the area may actually be fragile. It shares some sequence relationships to the things that have been found in fragile chromosomes uh, in humans. We've actually now cloned the region into uh, yeast artificial chromosome clones to measure breakage rates, and the marine sequence is fragile, and the mutation process eliminates the fragility. So if you look at the alleles that have spun out in these freshwater populations, they've eliminated some feature that makes it prone to breakage. Despite that, when the deletions occur, the chromosome on which they occur then shows molecular signatures of positive selection. So we don't think the region is just decaying. We think that this area is prone to throw off adaptive alleles that are then subject to positive selection in these, uh, in these populations. And you're right, once you've thrown the thing away, that should be an irreversible change if it's only present in one copy in the initial uh, populations. And that's actually something we're also starting to, uh, to, to address now because of some other features which suggest there may be a lot of variability in the region. What, ha what happens when you normalize for the target? size of coding region versus non-coding. I mean, you're saying it's 89 versus, what was it, you know, a much smaller percent for coding, but yep. the target size of the two is grossly different. It depends on how you count the target size. If the target size for the regulatory elements is uh, surrogate would be the accumulated conserved sequences that are found outside of the coding exon. Um, that would probably be, you know, roughly equal target size. Uh, because it's only a small fraction of the genome that is either coding or conserved non-coding, and nonetheless, we see that we see that we see the strong bias. Um, you know, I will say that when we started this project, we did not have an axe to grind on the coding versus regulatory issue. The whole philosophy here was let the fish tell us uh, what's been important, or in the case of scale genome studies in humans, it's let the chips fall where they may for whatever uh, the patterns of variation are in different human populations. I do think it's striking that when you compare those distributions, uh, the loci that look like they underlie adaptive change have a, a huge fraction of uh, regulatory change. Eric? David, can you say a few things about how the sort of the goals and sort of the, the view, strategic view of your SEGS changed over the 10 years of its lifespan? Because if my memory is Absolutely. right, this, the, you know, when you started, and I think I was actually there when this first grant was yep. started, I remember it had a, a slightly different flavor and it really did evolve. But I'm, I'm saying this in a good way because maybe you could also frame the answer as to the flexibility of the program or how the yep. program allowed you to change over that decade. So I think, Eric, that's a great question. And uh, when this thing was originally funded, uh, it was Will Talbot as the PI. Sticklebacks as one of the specific aims, but the other key specific aims was looking at uh, issues of gene duplication and sub-functionalization uh, using zebrafish. And although uh, we worked on that as part of the first five, year, five years of the SEGS, we felt at the end of the first five years that the stickleback stuff was going great and, in fact, in many ways better than um, the biggest skeptics uh, imagined. And the zebrafish stuff was, frankly, going uh, worse than we had originally hoped with the Morpholino approach, which was the primary way of trying to parse out the uh, functions of the, the different gene duplicates, actually often uh, revealing Morpholino artifacts instead of the subtle differences between uh, sub-functionalized genes. So at the five-year point, uh, we decided for the second phase to focus entirely on uh, stickleback evolution, phase the zebrafish out. And the one other thing that we added, and I didn't have time to talk about today, has been um, trying to apply the principles found from sticklebacks to other organisms. So the new aim that we also picked up in the second phase was uh, trying to look for the sorts of patterns we see in sticklebacks in genes that underlie uh, evolutionary change in, in other mammals. So I think we've been flexible. When we originally put the proposal together, uh, we knew that some people would see the sticklebacks as very, very risky and it might not work at all. Uh, for those people, zebrafish was there as something that, well, that will probably give uh, data for sure. Yeah. As it turned out, um, the, the, the most exciting science uh, we thought came from the part that was the riskiest and we did have the flexibility to adjust those priorities as the, as the program went on.
Can I ask one more question? So uh, Susan Rosenberg has published a lot on, uh, on um, increased mutation rate in E. coli in response to a variety of ex external environmental stresses. And I'm wondering whether there's a relationship between shift in electrolytes and in sodium content of the external milieu on recombination and deletion. So that's a, a great question, and again, something we're quite interested in, because I'm intrigued by the possibility that the very act of migration out of the ocean environment, which is both buffered in temperature and salt levels, into freshwater environments that have much more variable temperatures and a whole range of different salinities, might actually influence the mutations that underlie some of the adaptations uh, that are seen in fresh water. And that's one of the reasons we're working hard now to monitor the mutation mechanisms that underlie the deletion of this regulatory element, because we'd also like to see whether it's sensitive to environmental conditions. Yep. I had a similar thought that I don't know much about how transposon sequences are organized in the genome, but certainly in some organisms you have those kinds of stress responses, either temperature or even salt, et cetera, you can activate movement. And I'm wondering what maybe that would be too high a frequency for those kinds of events that, that are, were required for this adaptive evolution. But I wonder about the regulatory sequences being related to transposome sequences, whether they're new or ancient. I think that's a, a, an interesting possibility. There's actually lots of proposals in the evolutionary literature about the kinds of molecular mechanisms that might underlie adaptive change, including transposons and repeats and microRNAs and uh, gene duplicates and all sorts of things. Um, I think we're just at the beginning of being able to address those because of the uh, case histories and the genome-wide set of loci. We have not yet seen that proposed mechanism where uh, transposons are popping in as the uh, mutational mechanism that's generated something in fresh water although there's one trait that someone has just started to work on the lab that has a little bit of that smell right now. So we'll see. <laughs>